Uh, I would like to take a minute because I, I think it's appropriate for us to acknowledge those people in our community who are on the front lines of, of fighting uh, this virus. So let's take a minute and, and uh, thank the, the uh, medical community, our first responders, uh, folks in, in government positions that are making a lot of the decisions to keep people safe and, and uh, um, uh, you know, take, taking in all the information, making good decisions. So uh, just as a business community, um, we want to stop and say thank you to those folks. And, um, you know, we're, we're in the fight with you. As a business community, our role is a little different. We're, we're, we're going to fight this thing from the economic side. So it's our job to keep as many people working and the community moving and protect as many jobs as possible. So uh, looking forward to, to hearing from our guests today because they're the ones really driving and, and going out and, and helping make the decisions and enact the policies that will allow us to do that. Um, so as you know, today, first off, we're gonna start off with talking with Senator John Cornyn. And then, uh, then soon after that, we will talk to uh, Elsie Collins with the, the Deputy Director of the, uh, of, of the SBA here uh, regionally. Um, so with that being said, let me, let me uh, introduce uh, Senator Cornyn real quick. Uh, most of you probably know he was first elected as Senator in 2002, uh, originally from San Antonio. Uh, he currently serves in the Senate on the Finance, Intelligence, and uh, Judiciary Committees. He's also uh, recently served a stint as the uh, uh, as the whip in the Senate. Um, before joining the Senate, he also served Texas in many other ways as a, as a district judge, as a member of the Texas Supreme Court, and, bef and uh, after that, the uh, te uh, Texas Attorney General. Um, so I, I will uh, uh, let uh, Senator Cornyn speak, and then after that, I've got a few questions I've got teed up for him. So Senator Cornyn, Welcome to Waco virtually. Well, thank you, Rick, and thanks to the uh, chamber. Uh, normally, about this time, you'd be finalizing your plan for your annual fly-in in May. Uh, but since we won't be meeting in Washington this year, I'm glad we're able, able to talk at least in this, uh, using this wonderful technology. Uh, I appreciate you organizing the calls so we can provide businesses with information about the resources available to them in response to the coronavirus. I'm glad to see Elsie here, and certainly the SBA has been a very popular organization, been instrumental in this fight. Congress has now passed three separate bills to provide resources, first to our healthcare providers, but then to uh, workers who are out of a job through no fault of their own, and businesses who are wondering how they're gonna remain, their, remain solvent during this uh, economic fallout. Part of the challenge has been that uh, we simply don't know what we don't know. We don't know how long this is going to last, although we're starting to see some, uh, some uh, good signs in terms of that flattening the curve that we've all talked about, particularly in hot spots like New York and, uh, and uh, New Orleans, for example. But I, let me walk you through some of the main provisions of the CARES Act that was signed by President Trump a, a week ago last Friday. As I mentioned, the first job was to make sure we provided for our healthcare providers who were taking care of us. And uh, our hospitals have had to defer all elective surgery, which is basically where they make, the, make ends meet, and uh, to maintain capacity in case uh, there's a surge of cases. And they've also needed things like masks, gloves, and other personal protective equipment. And so this first tranche of $100 billion nationwide to our hospitals provides uh, our rural hospitals the ability to stay open and be responsive, but also to our suburban and urban hospitals what they need to be ready for whatever is coming at them. We also uh, jump-started the uh, process of, of discovering a vaccine uh, which ultimately would be part of the toolkit, as well as uh, many clinical trials, as you know, uh, are underway testing existing drugs to see whether they might be useful against this virus. Um, I know many Waco area businesses are stepping up. Um, I remember my visit to, to the prize-winning whiskey makers over at Balcones Distillery on one of my trips to Waco, and I know now they're in the process of uh, gearing up to make hand sanitizer which there's been a huge rush on. 
and Waco Manufacturing Gel Pro, which ordinarily makes gel insoles for your shoes, I'm told is now making medical grade face shields for nurses and doctors on the front lines. You know, one of the things this virus is already teaching us is the vulnerability of our supply chain uh, when it comes to medical equipment, when it comes to pharmaceuticals. And uh, I'm sure there are many, many more lessons we need to learn, but those are, uh, that's uh, why it's so important that our local communities step up and fill this void as we surge to maximum uh, wartime footing. I'm amazed, but not surprised, at the ingenuity and the generosity of countless individuals who support our communities. That's what we always do, and particularly in Texas when times are tough, we pull together. Well, many people through no fault of their own simply don't have any money coming in the front door, and uh, maybe they're in the service industry, maybe they work for tips or hourly wages. And so this is really unprecedented. Um, uh, the federal government is sending direct financial help to uh, folks with a health, household income of up to $150,000. A family of four could receive as much as $3,400. That's a direct deposit in your bank account. The goal was within two to three weeks of a week ago, so hopefully no longer than two more weeks, uh, we'll see that assistance get out to those folks who are the most vulnerable and who need to pay the rent, provide uh, buy meat, food for their family, and the necessities of life. We also know that the uh, Texas Workforce Commission is getting just crushed by new unemployment insurance applications. And I know Governor Abbott and his administration are working hard to make sure that they're able to accept the applications and process them on a timely basis. But we expanded unemployment insurance eligibility as part of this safety net program, this lifeline and provided an extra $600 a week in federal benefits on top of the state's portion. Uh, we extended it for an additional 13 weeks. We broadened it to cover independent contractors and um, uh, nonprofits and uh, the gig workers, so to speak. And we all felt like it was really important for the country to come together and get help to individuals like this. And then it comes to the small businesses, which, the, uh, which you represent. Um, we know they are the backbone, the main employer of our, of our workforce in America. So we started with this idea that uh, we want to encourage employers to keep their employees on the payroll, if at all possible. And so we provided some incentives to do that in the form of a loan that can be forgiven uh, at the end of eight weeks, it provides uh, up to 250% of essentially your cash flow requirements for rent or salaries. And if you keep your employees on the payroll until June, uh, that loan can be completely forgiven. And this is an extraordinary incentive, I think. I hope it works, uh, but certainly as Elsie will vouch, uh, there's been a huge number of applications already processed and we are worried now that it's going to be so heavily subscribed that we're going to, we have to put more money into the uh, program. And that's what I expect to see tomorrow. Senator McConnell likely will go to the floor and try to get a uh, unanimous agreement to put another $250 billion in that as we continue to try to help small businesses keep their folks on payroll. And our goal, of course, is once we defeat this virus, as we will, we want to make sure those jobs are there and that those businesses are there and can ramp back up as quickly as possible. But all this is new and it's a lot, uh, lot to process. We're all learning together, but I'd encourage all of you to apply sooner rather than later. And talk to, uh, in addition to the SBA, and Elsie can give you some more guidance here, but your SBA certified lenders, your local bank, and, uh, and because with whom you already have a a relationship because we're working with a lot of the Texas Bankers Association, the credit unions and others to try to make sure we get this out the door and into the hands of the people who are, we intend to get it into who need it the most and can put it to the best use. We also um, approved a number of, a, num uh, a large amount of money, $150 billion for state and local governments now, this will be distributed primarily through the governor's office for cities under 500,000 people, and it's based on a per capita formula. Texas uh, received 11.2 billion of that money, and so 
Uh, some of it will go directly to cities and counties, about 500,000 people, but the rest will be distributed, most of it, uh, through the governor's office. My hope is that'll be done by the end of this month. Now, one of the other things we funded is community development block grants, and Waco has just been awarded more than $800,000 in these grants. These can be used uh, for a, a range of coronavirus-related activities like testing, meals, loans to support local businesses. It's, it's uh, designed to be uh, flexible, so it can be used to uh, where it's needed the most. So I know we've been in touch with many of you about the process of applying through the SBA, and I'm sure you'll learn more from Herb and Elsie, uh, who've accepted my invitation to join us on this call. And many of you know uh, Sandy Edwards, uh, my longtime regional director there in Austin, is now retired. Jeff Williford has, uh, has been promoted. Jeff, of course, is the deputy. He's now my regional director there. And I encourage you, encourage you all to reach out to him if we can ever be of additional assistance. So let me say in conclusion, thanks to all of my friends with the Greater Waco Chamber. And I'm happy to answer or dodge a few questions. So Rick, it's back to you. Yeah, great. Well, you, you, you covered a lot there. I mean, these are obviously historic decisions um, that, that are being made. Uh, I'd, I'd be curious to know, um, you know, in order to make those decisions, where, where are you getting your information? What you know, advisement are you getting? What, how, how are you getting the information you need to make the decisions with? Well, I'm blessed with a incredible professional staff, uh, many of whom are on this call and uh, who are listening to the responses we get from you. Um, but of course, a lot of it has to do with uh, my reaching out to folks like the Waco Chamber. I've been uh, busier than I ever would have imagined being confined to this space here uh, and being able to communicate on video chat, Skype, Zoom, webinars, and uh, just good old fashioned telephone calls. And uh, so we've tried to absorb as much as we can, but the fact is we very rarely act with this kind of speed, but we felt like this was an emergency. We needed to get this done quickly. So we knew there would be gaps there'd be some unintended consequences. And so the thing that you all can continue to do is to help us figure out what needs to be done to tweak this to make it work even better. And uh, I've heard a number of uh, suggestions already. We expect probably there will be, will be a fourth in, uh, installment of the uh, coronavirus response. But as I said, we're hopeful that eventually we can begin gradually getting back to of the new normal, whatever that looks like. But in the interim, we realize there are a lot of people who are suffering and we need to try to figure out ways we can help. And uh, so you can, you can help us do that. But in, in the meantime, we're talking to everybody from the president to Secretary Mnuchin, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, who by the way, uh, part of the, about half of the money, I, I should say about $500 billion, is uh, going to be available through a new lending facility uh, through the Federal Reserve that they're going to stand up here probably in a week. These will be collateralized loans and may not be this type of thing that small businesses would uh, need access to, but I, I know I've talked to a number of uh, Texas businesses that happen to be part of national chains. And so they're trying to figure out on a larger scale what you're trying to figure out too in your small business. And that is how to keep afloat pay the bills and uh, keep your employees connected to your business. So uh, when we come out of this recovery. So, so you mentioned the next wave possibly of legislation. Uh, do you have any more details on what might be covered in, in any future? Well, there's been some talk about infrastructure and, you know, infrastructure is one of those things that's nonpartisan and everybody we thought we should be doing that anyway. And obviously, mm -hmm. Texas being a fast growing state, uh, anybody who's been on I 35 knows we need more and uh, mm -hmm. uh, better infrastructure for public safety and the environmental concerns in the economy. Uh, if we do it as part of this, that's fine. But really, I feel like we're in an emergency situation. And what we're trying to do is, is uh, deal with the emergency first. But I'm sure there'll be a whole mm -hmm. host of of uh, suggestions and additional discussions about what will be included. But again, what you all can help me do the most is to send to Jeff or to me or my other staff uh, things that you think that we missed that need to be included, things need to be changed. And that, that would be part of that package would be my goal. 
Um, <clears throat> Unlike many other past disasters, such as let's say a hurricane, where it affects you know a specific region or part of the country, I mean this this is affecting the whole country and the whole world essentially. Right. So a lot of this comes down to how you know relatively well different areas can handle <clears throat> the the situation. So how do you feel Texas is positioned, at least within North America, to to handle the situation, and where will we come out when it's all said and done? Well, I think we're I think we're better positioned than uh, than most, and you know there's a lot of differences. So you saw what happened in Italy, for example. They have an elderly population, um, people who are living in congested quarters. This virus loves a crowd, which is one reason why we all are separating and and uh, at, uh, doing social distancing and the like. Uh, it can't leap tall buildings in a single bound. We know that. And so there are things we can do with personal protective equipment for first responders and, and uh, hospitals and healthcare providers, and just things we can do, common sense, washing your hands and that sort of thing. But uh, eventually, before uh, I think we get a, a really good handle on this, we're gonna need for these clinical trials to come up with a, with a uh, treatment. And there are already some promising, uh, promising drugs, but they need to test both safety and efficacy and then, as I said earlier, the vaccine. It was a surprise to me to learn that, uh, that even seasonal flu vaccines, because the, the viruses tend to mutate over time, can be you know, maximum, maybe 60% effective. In other words, you can get a vaccination for seasonal flu and still get the flu because the virus has, has changed. So this is, a, this is a challenge for our scientists and our researchers and public health specialists uh, but we will get through this. Uh, what we need to do is figure out how to stop these viruses from getting a foothold in the first place. Many of them originate in animals and jump to humans and uh, then uh, spread around the world. So, uh, and we have no natural immunity or defense to this because it's, so, uh, it's so new. Um, but I think uh, Texas is doing well. The one thing I keep hearing folks say is there needs to be a one size fits all when it comes to uh, uh, congestion, group gatherings, uh, shutting down businesses, which ones are essential and not essential. And I try to tell them, look, uh, you know, Texas is a big diverse state. There's a big difference between Dallas and Houston and Loving County where we have more cows and people. And uh, so uh, social distancing is not a problem in a large part of our state. So I'm, I'm really been pleased at, uh, at how uh, the leaders at the state and local level around the country have, have responded, obviously in cooperation with and working with the federal government, but it's not all coming out of Washington, nor should it, because we are a big, diverse country. Okay, so I've got one kind of specific Waco question for you. Uh, education, uh, higher ed is a big part of our economy here, and we've got uh, Baylor, TSTC, MCC, so, so all these programs you mentioned, you know, what do you see that's going to be there to help those institutions and the students that, that populate them? Well, Waco is a, is a really a, uh, uh, when I think about it, all the different uh, institutions of higher education, I'm sure they've suffered some financial and other losses. Uh, I assume that a lot of students have gone online to try to uh, continue their studies. I know even with students overseas, let's say doing foreign study and then having to come back and a lot of dislocation there. Uh, what I might do, Rick, if it's okay with you, I might get to Claire Sanderson, who helps me on those issues, send you some specific information because you're right, Waco is known for its higher education institutions and, and I'd like to get something specific to you if I may. Great. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'll give you a couple more minutes if you wanna, wanna close and then we'll, we'll keep the program moving forward. Well, I'll be brief because you have other speakers, but let me just say that, uh, you know, we've been through some challenging times in our state, in our nation, um, but nothing we can't handle as long as we uh, uh, help each other. Um, it reminds me of something uh, somebody told me one time. He said, you know what makes God laugh? He says, it's when we, we make plans. And uh, certainly, uh, obviously, this was not planned by us, uh, but we... Uh, we, uh, we, we will adapt and we are responding to it together. And what's so encouraging to me every time, whether it's Hurricane 
Harvey or whatever it is, uh, we all, the communities always pull together and help each other out and uh, we'll get through this. In the meantime, there's a role for each of us to play, not only in keeping ourselves healthy and our families, loved ones healthy, but also our community. And uh, we're uh, just glad to be your partner and work with you as we get to the other side of this. We'll, uh, if, if it goes the way I hope it will, we'll, we'll see a big downturn in the, third in the second quarter of this year, obviously a huge economic uh, drop off, about 25% of our economy or so. But then um, if once we get past that um, in this third and fourth quarter, hopefully we'll see according to some of the folks like JP Morgan, they expect a, a big bounce back. And uh, so that's what I'm hoping for. And that's what we need to be prepared for. And that's why it's so important for us to be working with the Waco Chamber and all of your businesses so that you're in a position uh, to uh, bounce back too. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Thank, and thank you for your service too. Um, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, next, uh, I'm going to hand off the program to Matt Metters, our CEO and President of the Greater Waco Chamber of Commerce. So, Matt, it is all yours. And Rick, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and again, my warmest thanks to the Senator as well. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, we're very, very fortunate today to have with us Elsie Collins. And Elsie is the Deputy District Director for the U.S. Small Business Administration. The office is out of Dallas. And um, past couple of weeks, Elsie hasn't had much to do. So she was really looking for an opportunity to, uh, to join us today. Now, Elsie, all kidding aside, um, I, I am sure that you have just been inundated. You've been swamped. And um, we continue to have a lot of conversations with our business community and you know, we're having industry specific conference calls and just all sorts of questions um, and um, feedback from those folks related to these SBA loan programs. And so we're gonna turn it over to you and let you talk to us a little bit uh, for a little while. And we're receiving some questions from the business community, from the participants that are here today. And once you uh, have had an opportunity to share some thoughts with us, um, we're gonna ask you a few questions. Okay. Okay. All right. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, first of all, um, I want to thank uh, Senator Cornyn and his incredible staff uh, for their support of SBA and then just the work that they're doing in the community and the business community. Uh, very committed uh, to hearing the issues and we are, are grateful uh, to con consider them um, an advocate and, and a partner uh, for small businesses. Um, uh, with regard to SBA, we have been uh, quite busy here uh, recently uh, because of COVID-19. And what I'd like to do for uh, take a few minutes and just kind of go over a couple of the SBA funding options that are available as a result of COVID-19. I'll give you a little brief overview, and then I think you uh, have some questions. Uh, you may have a few questions for me as well. So uh, first and foremost, um, our hearts and our prayers go out to the uh, individuals that are actually struggling uh, medically with the effects of COVID. And then um, also we are, our hearts also go out to the, to the businesses that are being severely impacted by COVID-19. Uh, uh, the businesses, you know, the small businesses are the backbone of our economy. Uh, economy. Uh, two out of three jobs that are created here in the United States are created by small business. So the small businesses are, are, are key uh, to, our, to our economy and particularly in the state of Texas. We have an uh, incredible number of small businesses. Uh, the Small Business Administration will continue to uh, work with our partners to, to get as much information out about the different programs that are available and will continue to help the small businesses that are out there. Uh, first and foremost, I want to make sure that everyone is aware of the website that's available. And that is where SBA is posting all of the information about COVID-19 as well as the resources that are available. Uh, it is www.sba.gov, www.sba.gov. They go to that website, they will see all of the information and the various resources that are specific to SBA about um, COVID-19. Um, there's a couple of different programs uh, that SBA has available that I wanna make mention, uh, and all this information is on our website uh, for the small businesses that have been impacted. First and foremost, um, the applicants may have heard about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Assistance. 
once Texas was declared uh, almost two weeks ago, uh, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program was the key uh, program that was available. And they could apply online uh, on the portal that was available. Uh, that was an Economic Injury Disaster Loan, which is referred to as an EIDL, E-I-D-L. And it was a low interest loan that was offered for 30 years with a 3.75% term. That was what applicants, or business applicants could apply for. Uh, a week ago, a new portal went up where we've added the advance, the, the advance, loan advance to that economic injury disaster loan. So when applicants go to apply online, they will see also the advance program that can advance up to $10,000 on that economic injury disaster loan. So on our website at sbaww.gov, there's an application for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. But the direct link to just the application alone is covid19relief.sba.gov forward slash. That will take all of the business owners directly to that Economic Injury Disaster Loan application if they haven't already applied. The second program that uh, became available as a result of the CARES Act is the Paycheck Protection Program, also known as the PPP. Um, and this is the loan program to where the funds will come directly from the lender. SBA is giving a guarantee to the lender. So for business owners that are applying for the PPP, they would go directly to their lender to see, or their bank, to see if they are offering the PPP and try to get the application or try to get their application in to that lender. The PPP applications are available on the SBA website and they can be downloaded, completed, and those would be submitted to their actual lender. And that is the program that where it has the forgiveness portion of it, that 75% of that PPP loan should be used for payroll. And that was part of the, that's an incentive for the, for the employers to keep their employees uh, in, in, in the pay status and employed. The third program that we want to make sure that uh, all of the business owners are aware of, and this is specifically for business owners who already have an existing SBA loan. So let's say that prior to COVID-19, they had an, a bus, an SBA loan to start their business or expand their business. What SBA is doing for those individuals that already have an SBA loan is they are offering, offering the SBA debt relief, meaning that SBA will make the payments on that loan to the bank on their, on their behalf for six months. So all they would need to do is contact their lender and the lender has some instructions in terms of what they will need to do. So that is for business owners who already have an existing 7A loan or a 504 loan or a micro loan that came from SBA. And that is a relief that's there for those small business owners. That also applies to individuals that may have been impacted by a disaster in the past, and they actually have a disaster loan. If they actually have a disaster loan that is current and they're continuing to make payments, they can contact the SBA servicing office about that six months of no payments. And then fourth and finally is the SBA Express Bridge Loan Program. This is a program that SBA has for the, where, that is offered by existing lenders. Some of SBA's lenders have a designation as an SBA Express lender, and they have the authority to offer a loan up to $25,000 as a bridge loan until the business owner receives their economic injury disaster loan. It's up to $25,000, and we've got uh, so we can provide on our website a list of the lenders that are participating in the SBA Bridge Loan Program. So that's just basically an overview of the existing four SBA funding options uh, that are available right now uh, uh, for small business owners that have actually been impacted by uh, uh, the corona COVID-19. So I'm going to pause right there and allow you to ask the, the designated questions that you have or maybe cover something that I, I, I maybe didn't cover. 
Elsie, thank you for that overview. We do have some questions that are coming in. Um, so you just got through talking a little bit about um, the loan programs. Question is, there's been a bit of confusion um, related to PPP and EIDL. Can businesses apply for the PPP and the EIDL loan as long as they are for different allow allowable expenses? And the rest of the question is, um, some lenders are saying that if an employer has applied for an EIDL loan, they cannot also seek the PPP. So can you clarify that for us? Yes. So if, um, if a business owner has already applied for an economic injury disaster loan, that does not disqualify them for applying for the PPP loan. What would happen, is, in, in essence, the way it's supposed to work is that the PPP is primarily for the payroll, but it does allow some other expenses, your rent and utilities, and, you know, mortgage payments on the building, but there cannot be a duplication of that same payment, or the, it cannot be a duplication to where you apply for PPP and you're going to use that for payroll, and you apply for an idle and you're going to use that for payroll for that same period. That can't be. So generally, what happens is when the business owner applies for a PPP, they will let their lender know that they have applied for an idle an economic injury disaster loan. They will provide the status, whether or not it's actually been approved or it's pending or they haven't heard anything. And then in that calculation, they, if, if there's been a, a loan, if there's been funds that's been expensed, then the, lo the, the lender would account for that in their calculation because under that payroll, if they've already received the economic injury disaster loan from SBA, when the lender calculates their eligibility under the payroll protection, they will include that amount that they got from SBA into that amount so that they can take that amount and give it back to SBA to pay to wipe that completely out. So um, there's got to be some communication in there so that there isn't any duplication. But if it was for, let's say a person got an economic injury disaster loan and if it was and it was wasn't used for payroll and it was from other expenses, then that would not be considered a, a duplication. Okay. Very good. So another question, uh, how confident can businesses be that they'll receive the full projected amount of the PPP based on the payroll and expenses times 2.5? What obstacles would prevent them from receiving the full amount? And there's language that says that they will receive up to the projected amount. And as they forecast their future, future financial obligations, it'd be helpful to know with certainty how much they will be receiving. It's a long question. You can break it up okay. a little bit. Okay. But they're, they're quite, the question is how confident can businesses be that they'll receive the full projected amount of the PPP? Okay, I mean, I think, you know, it's still early on, so we don't have a whole lot of re results yet. But the, the lenders have the same guidance in terms of how to calculate uh, the PPP eligibility. What the business owner will need to do is they need to make sure that they provide their lender with that documentation that supports how they came up with that amount. Your payroll records. Um, I talked to a lender earlier today uh, when I was on a call with him and they're asking for the 941 or if they are using uh, payroll processing uh, uh, companies that they are getting those statements and they're submitting those with their act, actually app, application. So uh, review the application carefully, make sure it's completed, and then any supporting documentation to support those numbers should be submitted also with that application. And I, I think that's a better idea, that's a better indication of that you're going to get the, the funds that you actually need. Okay. So this is from a small retailer. Um, what's the timeline for receiving the PPP and also the EIDL from applying to being approved to cash in hand? Okay, so uh, let me speak to the PPP first. Uh, the PPP, SBA is still providing some instructions to the lenders. So it's my understanding this afternoon, they, uh, there was a, we had a conference call with the lenders uh, yesterday a lender connect call and they provide some instruction and they're supposed to provide them with some additional information with regard to the notes and that will get this thing rolling a little bit faster. Uh, once the actual lender 
is has processed and approved that loan, then there's a certain time frame that they actually have to disperse and close that loan. Um, they have been, once they get all the information, and some of that information is still coming from SBA to the lender, uh, they have were advised that they have five days from the date of approval, I believe it's going to be five business days from the date of approval to disperse that loan on the on the on the PPP. But my understanding is the lenders are still waiting some, for some instruction from our headquarters on some of the the, 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 the documents. They can some of the lenders can prepare uh, the loan documents on uh, the loan paperwork on their existing documents while they're waiting for SBA. But there's some additional guidance that should be coming down from SBA to the lenders to give them a little bit better guidance and hopefully they will have that today. Now, on the economic injury disaster loan, that's a direct loan that's coming from SBA. Um, at one point, there was <coughs> guidance out there that indicated that once you applied and your loan was approved, that you would receive your, at least the advance or some compensation within three to five days. It's my understanding that three to five days is not occurring uh, consistently. So there's a significant amount of volume uh, because you know, you've got 50 states, all the businesses, millions of businesses right. that are actually going into the system. So it's a little, it is a little bit of a delay. The, so I really can't give a, a, a good timeline on that, unfortunately. Hopefully this week I'll have a little bit better timeline and we'll have a little bit better results to where I can actually provide maybe an update on what that time frame kind of looks like. So I don't really have a good time frame on that right now. Uh, the key thing is, for the individuals that have actually applied in, that econ in the economic injury disaster loan portal to make sure that when they've applied, that they actually got an application number when they hit the send button. So when they submitted their application, that they did receive an application number because that's the reference number. Uh, for applications that were submitted as of last week in the new portal, that application number would start with a three. If they've got the three, then they're in uh, they're actually in the most recent portal. Uh, some of the applicant, business applicants who applied before last Monday uh, received a loan application that started with a two. Uh, and they should, they, at least they have a reference number there. Um, and they should be able to still, they should be okay still with that in that portal. But I'll have additional information uh, later this week in terms of how the processing speed is going and where we are at that point. But I do understand that there has been some disbursements of that $10,000 advance to, uh, to business owners. I just don't have a good feel in terms of really what the total numbers are at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question for landlords and developers. What is the best way for landlords to utilize EIDL or other relief programs in order to benefit their tenants? Can they extend lease forgiveness to their tenant businesses or to the residential renters and be repaid through the EIDL? Okay, so um, in the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, when they're processing that loan, and they're talking to their loan officer, if they have um, uh, given them some passes, if you will, on the rents or things like that, they'll just need to communicate that the losses or whatever they've done to their processing loan officer and they can determine how they're gonna work that. Because it, it is a situation where uh, they didn't have the income coming in and so they are making allowances for their tenant. And so, uh, at this point, I'll probably have to shift that to the processing, uh, to the processors uh, there uh, for them to decide how that's gonna be. That's more of an eligibility, uh, but um, there are, those are concessions that they are making, so they should still be able to, it's not gonna disqualify them for applying for an economic injury disaster loan. They'll just need to communicate that and any support, any additional supporting uh, information, they'll, their loan officer will ask them for that when they're actually processing the loan but it does, it's not gonna disqualify them because they're giving uh, you know, some concessions on the, on, the, on the rent or payments like that. One of the questions that we've received is, 
seeking clarification on if a layoff occurs between mid-February and the end of April. If a company has to make that decision and then the employees are brought back by the June deadline, <clears throat> will those payroll expenses be eligible to be forgiven by the forgivable grant portion in the PPP? Um, I'll need to seek some some clarification on that before I can kind of answer that. But the the uh, the PPP program was intended to um, you know it was an incentive to keep the people employed, but it also said if you rehired them as well, right? So um, that you would still have the eligibility mm -hmm. and to, to give it for, forgiven. So all of that will be taken in consideration. Um, as far as the time frame, I'm not really sure about that, but if you actually brought those employees back, then that you would still be in that um, eligibility window, if you will, for forgiveness. But on that, I would double check with the lender, and we're still getting additional guidance on that. And if it, and on frequent, and I will, what I will do is I will forward that question up because we're putting our frequently asked questions out on the site. And periodically, uh, those are being updated and addressed. And addressed. And so I can add that one to one to make sure it's very, very clear for that on the rehiring. Yeah, that that would be helpful. We're starting to get that get that question quite a bit, Elsie. Um, right. And there's there is a, a new Paycheck Protection Program FAQ that I can send out to you after this uh, after this uh, call that you can uh, make that available to your uh, to your your members. Good, that would be very helpful. Here, here's another question. This one comes from a builder and we're trying to, it's a clarifying question. Do 1099 employees need to apply for the PPP themselves or may the employer with 1099 employees include those employees in their PPP or EIDL payroll expenses? Okay, yeah, that's the hot question and um, the answer is for the 1099s that the employer cannot include the 1099 income in their calculation. But, and that's because the 1099 recipient is eligible to apply themselves. And in the frequently asked questions that I will send out to you today, it specifically addressed that. Okay. And it's actually it's, in, the inter, and I, in the interim rule as well. That would be very helpful. Um, Another question we have is related to PPP and nonprofit organizations. We've heard some conflicting information related to eligibility. Um, initially, it was our understanding that through PPP, only 501c3s and 501c19s veteran groups were eligible to um, apply through PPP. Then we heard last week, late last week, that all nonprofits had become eligible to apply for PPP. Can you clarify that for us? Okay, yeah, on that one, um, and that question came up on the call yesterday and I received clarification this morning, so I will double check it. But it was that um, I didn't have it all. Um, I just had the first part of what you said, the, the, the 503Cs, but not all. But under the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, the, all of the nonprofits could apply under the economic injury, but not necessarily on the PPP. But I will, I will clarify that. Yeah, we need clarification, clarification, Elsie, because we've the um, the information we received late last week, and I say this respectfully, came from SBA. So it would be helpful if we could if we could get clarification. Our nonprofit community is asking okay. that question. Okay. Okay. Last question for you, and then we'll, we'll let you get off the hot seat and, and get back to business okay. and we'll let our, our fellow business people and the folks on the call get back to business as well. We're here, we understand some lenders for the PPP are requiring collateral. What guidance for lenders exists regarding waiving collateral or personal guaranteed requirements? Um, as far as requi uh, requiring the collateral. I'll need to follow up on that as well um, as far as the, guide, the guidance that went out. So um, let me check that one out as well. Okay. So Elsie, what we'll do is we'll wait to hear back from you and we'll get some clarifying 
um, responses and the FAQs and so forth. And we'll get that information um, posted up on our website and we'll get it out to everybody as best as we possibly can then. Yeah. Okay, great. And if you if you will uh, email me um, afterward, then I will send the the, uh, the FAQs that I already have. I'll get those out to you. Absolutely, we'll get them to you. Is is there anything else in closing that you'd like to share today with uh, the folks on the call? Um, the only thing I would share is um, to continue to um, uh, seek the SBA website for any uh, any guidance. Um, we also have a, um, a list of all of the SBA lenders that are making loans in the 72 counties that we serve. We've got a complete list of those. I'll make sure I'll get those to you so you'll have those. That's a list of all of the uh, existing SBA lenders that are, are doing SBA loans. And then also on, this, on the website, we've set up a Find Your Lender link to where you can uh, see which is the closest SBA lender that's close to you as well. So I can send that information out to you. But so take a look at everything that's on our website, sba.gov, and that we're also, there's also information that's being posted on the Treasury site too, as far as those frequently asked questions. So those are two sites or two websites that I would definitely uh, keep, keep in mind. Okay. Elsie, thank you. We really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, we You're may welcome. be, thank we, you so may, much. we may be calling on you again. Okay. Okay. Right. Thanks, no Elsie. Problem. Thank you. All right. Take thank care. you so much. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, folks, thank you all very much for taking time to join us today. Um, I just want to make sure that um, if you haven't had an opportunity to do so, uh, I would encourage you to go to the Chamber website. Um, we have a great resource page uh, connected to our Chamber uh, website, um, Waco Supporting Waco, and we're going to continue to um, update that information as often as we possibly can. So we want you to know that um, we're working tirelessly on your behalf. We appreciate you all very much. We appreciate everything you're doing for the chamber. Um, and if there's anything that we can do to help, uh, you folks are here with us and, and we're here for you. So reach out to us and call us and um, we'll move into action. So thank you all very much for joining today. And I, I would let you all know that we're gonna continue to provide these opportunities as much as we poss possibly can as we move into the future. So thank you and have a great day.